And now to our lab. It's time for some big body experiments. Some of them gory. This is not for the squeamish. Some extreme. It's freezing! We're ready. Are you? Ah! Just don't try anything you see here at home. Today we're looking at why we cough and the part of your body that makes it happen. Son, what are you doing? This is a lab, not a laundry. I know, but there is a time and a place to do your dirty washing, and this isn't it. Because today, we're going to look at one of the biggest organs in your body. The organ involved in coughing. Yes, it's... Your lungs! <laughs> That's what all this is for, Chris. If you laid your lungs out flat, opened up all the little spaces inside them, they'd be about 50 square metres. That's huge! That's the same as all this material around the lab. That's right, your lungs have a huge surface area. But to understand how you can fit it inside your chest, come and take a look at this. Here comes a gross alert. This is a real pair of cow's lungs. Now, people often think that lungs are a bit like empty bags full of air. But in fact, they're solid. So you can see here a cross section through the lung. Now, these tubes are the large airways that take air down to the segments. And the segments look like they're made of foam. And that's because the segments are full of tiny little air sacs called alveoli. In humans, alveoli are far too small to be seen. But you can see them in these massive cow's lungs. They pass oxygen from the air into your blood to be used by your body. And with every breath you take, you inhale air. Also, viruses, pollen, dust and bacteria. But don't worry, your lungs have an amazing trick to get rid of stuff that you inhale that you don't want. Coughing. <coughs> exactly. And we're going to show you how it works. Coughing is a really clever technique that your body uses to get rid of anything unwanted from inside your lungs, including the large amounts of mucus produced when you're ill with a chest infection. To show you how coughing works, we're going to inflate this pair of healthy lungs using gas from this canister. Zond, inflate the lungs. This is awesome! We've never done this before. Even at medical school, we never saw lungs inflated outside of a body. So here, where the lung's gone white, these alveoli are fully inflated. Wow! This is one of my favourite experiments ever, I think. These lungs are a lot like your lungs, but a bit bigger. They're actually about six times bigger. All right, Zand, turn off the gas and let's breathe out. And now the lungs are deflated. Now, to show you the importance of coughing, we need to infect one of these lungs. So I'm going to put some mucus into it. This is like what happens if you have a very serious chest infection. I'm going to insert some fake mucus into the lung. Now look what happens when Zand turns on the gas. The mucus-infected lung doesn't inflate properly anymore because it's blocked. And this shows you the importance of coughing for getting mucus out of your lungs so those airways don't get clogged up. And to demonstrate coughing, I've got some balloons over here. I have here two balloons. Now, mine is a nice, healthy, mucus-free balloon. Zand, I'm afraid yours is very badly infected, as you can see from the large amount of mucus in the airway. Ugh. Now, let's inflate the balloons. Three, two, one. Well, this doesn't feel fair, Chris. My mucus-filled balloon is really hard to blow up. See, my balloon inflates extremely easily and also <laughs> deflates extremely easily. How's it going, Zand? Very badly. <clears throat> I've got a mouthful of mucus and I can barely get any air into this lung. Seems to me, Zand, that you should have a bit of a cough. Ooh, that'll make me feel much better. OK, ready? Three, two, one. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> When you cough, all the muscles around your chest and abdomen contract suddenly. This creates enough force to eject the mucus up your trachea and out of your mouth, like the mucus coming out of this balloon. Now, that has nicely cleared the mucus from Zahn's airways, and now his lungs are clear again. So that's why you cough when you have a chest infection. We've shown you just how important the alveoli are in your lungs and how they help you breathe easily. And we've shown you that when they get clogged up with mucus, you can't inflate your lungs properly, so you have to cough. Plus, it was a great excuse to cover Zand in gunk. 
Well, I must say, Chris, after that cough, I feel a lot better. I'm off to play footy in the park. But what about this mucus on the floor? Who is going to help me tidy this up? Son! What was your experiment? Now we're getting ouch and about with our mobile clinic. Today, we're at a theme park to help solve your medical mysteries. If you're anxious about an ailment or curious about a condition, then the Ouchmobile is the place for you. That is incredible. Chris is preparing the clinic ready for his first patient. And Zand is out in the park to answer your burning questions. At the clinic, Chris is open for business. Next patient, please. First in is brother-sister tag team, nine-year-old Arman and Tamana, age 10. What has brought you to the Ouchmobile today? I've got a terrifying rotten gum. Tamana, what have you got? I think I've got a tooth on top of another. What's your double diagnosis, Doc? This sounds like a rare case of terrifying rotten gum and tooth on top of another tooth all in the same family, itis. Easy for you to say. Open wide. Now, how long have you had this problem for? As long as I live. As long as you've lived. So I don't think you've got an extra tooth. I think the tooth are crowded, so that one's being squeezed out. What can I do about it? Well, you can see a dentist is probably the best thing. OK. Right, open wide. Oh, look at that. Ouch! A bad case of tooth decay. Half your tooth is missing. It's so, our oh, man. How long do you brush your teeth for? 50 seconds. 50 seconds. Mm. Tamana, how long does your Five brother... To 10 seconds. 5 to 10 seconds. This could be the reason why Armand's tooth is rotten. Teeth need looking after, and that means brushing them twice a day for about two minutes. And how many times a day do you brush your teeth? Once. And how often should you brush your teeth? Um, twice. Armand's tooth will need to be taken out. But to keep the rest of his gnashes, he needs to get brushing. It can be boring, though, so any tips, Chris? Stand on one leg for a minute while you brush the bottom half of your teeth, and then you stand on the other leg for a minute while you brush the top half of your teeth. Hmm, I'm impressed. I think I'll try that myself. Away from the clinic, Zand is out and about in the park. Dr Zand, I have something that I need to show you. You've got bleeding under your nail, and the blood's got old, so it's gone black. That white line is how far your nail has grown since you injured it. In about four months, that'll get to the front and your nail might fall off. But then it'll grow back again, so you'll be fine. Why is it when you go upside down on roller coasters, um, does your face go red? But when you walk normally, your feet aren't red? Because you're designed to stand up, not stand on your head. There are actually valves which only allow the blood to go one direction around your body. So if the blood tries to go backwards into your feet, it can't go that direction. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's an excellent question. Back at the Ouchmobile, there's a new case in the waiting room. Next patient, please. And it's 10-year-old Alex, who's got some fascinating features on his fingers. So, Alex, what brings you to the Ouchmobile today? I've got a really weird thing where both my little fingers are bent. What's the diagnosis, Doc? It sounds to me like a case of I've got a really weird thing where both my little fingers are bent. Itis. That's right, Chris. So what we can see here is that the last bit of the little finger on both hands is just bending in. And that's because this bone has a slightly odd shape. So instead of being flat, that's just twisted in. So do you know what this is called? Delta phalanx deformity. Way to go, Dr Alex. We can also call it fifth finger clinodactyly. Oh, yes, the Greek forum, uh Bent little finger. Exactly. Will they ever go back to normal shape? They're never going to grow straight because the bone in the finger is a different shape on both sides, so it, it will always be bent. Now, it may be possible to have some exercises that make the things you want to do a bit easier. OK, thanks, Dr Chris. That's a pleasure. Job done for today, clinic closed. <laughs> We're both ouch and about. I'm hitting the wards with my ouch bleeper. Have you got a question for me? Yeah. Wow. And I'm hitting the streets to answer your medical mysteries. In the hospital playground, Zahn's in a right tangle. Quick, that's your bleeper. Ah. It's from Ellie. She's recovering from an operation. Hi, Ellie. How are you? Hi, Dr Zahn. Do you have a question for me? How does your spine keep you up on your feet? What's the diagnosis, Doc? Sounds to me like a case of, I want to know how your spine keeps you up on your feet-itis. You'd better put your back into this one, Zand. 
So your spine is made of bones called vertebrae. They stack up and between each one is a rubbery disc of cartilage. And that means your spine is almost like a sort of flexible bendy pole that's quite strong, but that on its own won't hold you upright. What you need around your spine is all the muscles that keep it held straight. So if you just had muscles with no spine, you'd still flop? If you took out your spine, you'd just collapse in a heap of jelly. But if you took away your muscles, you'd just fall down like a stack of blocks. So you need both muscles and bones. Why are you interested in your spine? Because I had an operation on my spine, because I have cerebral palsy. How do you explain cerebral palsy? The signals in my brain get muddled up and to go to my legs so that I walk on my tippy toes. And did the operation fix it? Yes. You deserve an Operation Ouch sticker. Thank you. Can you show me your walking? Mm -hmm. Brilliant, Ellie. Dr Chris is stepping out too. He's on a quest for questions. Dr Chris. What is your medical mystery question? My question is, on roller coasters, it feels like I don't have a stomach. So what you're describing is when the roller coaster gets to the top and you go over, that's when your stomach rises. What you're experiencing there is no gravity. So you're floating, and it's a bit like being in space. It can make you feel quite sick. What do you have to remember when you're sick on a roller coaster? You've got to be sick into the air so that it goes over all the people behind you. Yuck! Chris! Can I give you a sticker? Come on, Sand. Don't tell me you've never done it. That's your next call. It's from Bethany, who has an infection. Hi, Bethany. How are you? Hi, Sand. So have you got a question for me? I do. How are the painkillers know where the pain is? What's the diagnosis, Doc? Sounds to me like a case of, I want to know how the painkillers know where the pain is, itis. Ouch, that sounds painful. So the thing about painkillers is they actually don't know where to go. What they do is they work all over your body. Now, are you taking painkillers at the moment? Paracetamol and ibuprofen. These painkillers act both in the brain, where they stop pain signals being received, and elsewhere in the body. So wherever you have inflammation, you tend to get hot and red and swollen, and the anti-inflammatory painkillers that you're taking are damping down that inflammation so it hurts a bit less while your body mends. Does that make sense? It does. Here you go. Thank you. Bethany, thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Job done for today. Clinic closed. Ouch. Did you know no two people have identical sets of teeth? Your teeth are as unique as your fingerprint, so be proud of your gnashers. And now to our lab. It's time for some big body experiments. Some of them gory. This is not for the squeamish. Some extreme. It's freezing! We're ready. Are you? Just don't try anything you see here at home. Ah, oh, Chris, you're just in time. It's 2.30. So? You know what happens at 2.30. Uh, is it time for your nap? No! At 2.30, 2 30, we go to the dentist! 2.30. Anyway, come on, we've got to get an x-ray of your teeth. Fine, OK. To the cupboard of everything. Hi, Ellie. Hi, Chris. Hi, Ellie. Wow, Hi. there really is everything in your cupboards, aren't? X-ray complete. <laughs> now, this is called an orthopantomogram. Oh, no, it isn't. Oh, yes, it, no, it's not that kind of panto, Zand. The panto stands for the technique used, panoramic tomography. Now, the amazing thing about this is that you can see the whole tooth. If you look in your mouth, you can actually only see the top third. That's the crown, the white bit. But on the X-ray, we can see what's below the gum. Your teeth have roots, and they're twice as long as the crown. Now, that X-ray is really cool, Chris, but there's a lot more going on inside your tooth, and I'm going to show you using this huge model. <laughs> but, Zon, we don't need a huge model, because today we've got the real thing. <laughs> this is a tooth that's been given to us by a dentist that's been cut in half. What? You cut the dentist in half? No, Zon, the tooth has been cut in half. The dentist is absolutely fine. For you. Now, your teeth are made of amazing stuff. The glossy white surface layer is called enamel. 
It protects the whole tooth and it's the hardest substance in your entire body. But it can be worn away by acidic drinks and sugary food and it won't grow back once it's gone. So look after it. Now underneath is the layer called the dentin and underneath the dentin is the pulp and they're sensitive layers of living tissue and they support the enamel. They both contain nerves, which means that problems in your teeth can be painful. But have you ever noticed that your teeth are different shapes? Why is that? Well, we're going to show you. Only an edible experiment can answer that question. Ta -da! Why are you wearing that? We need to have a good close-up look. What Zahn's trying to say is that he's ready for the experiment and he wants to have a good close-up look at the different shapes of teeth, so he's using a mouth stretcher. That's what I said! So let's have a look at the four different types of teeth in Zahn's mouth, because they all do different jobs. At the front, we have incisors. Four at the top and four at the bottom. Just behind the incisors, there are canines. And then just behind the canines, there are the premolars. And just behind the premolars are the molars. But why do we need these four different types of teeth? Well, we're going to find out in... A terrific tooth testing test! We're going to see what happens when we bite and chew different foods using our teeth, but not our normal teeth of different shapes. We're going to be using... These! <laughs> we both have a custom-made set of gnashers, but they're made up of only one type of tooth. Zand has a full set of molars... So he's Team Molar. Chris has a mouthful of canines. So he's Team Canine. Our challenge is to bite into a range of food and chew it. Reveal the food. Then, rather than swallowing the food, we'll spit it out and see which type of tooth has worked best. First up, a sandwich. Mm. With soft food, Team Mola chews brilliantly. Whereas Team Canine can bite, but definitely can't chew. What you can see there is a perfect bite of sandwich, completely unchewed. What about eating a hard apple? I can't get any. I can't get any apple. Team Mola is really bad at biting. And Team Canine has a good bite, but can't chew it. You should give it to me and I can chew it up for you. What, and then give it back to me and I could swallow it? No, that's disgusting. And it's the same story with a steak. I can tear it off easily, but then I can't chew it. Watch. Well, I can chew it, but I can't actually get a piece off. Hmm, you're just pulverising it. So, who won that one then, Chris? Well, I don't think either of us did very well, did we? What a disaster. It proved exactly what we wanted, Zand. Only having one shape of tooth makes eating impossible. You need your sharp, pointy canines at the front for biting, and then your flat, wide molars at the back for mashing food up. So, we've shown you that the crowns of your teeth are covered in a hard layer called enamel, and inside your teeth you have layers called dentin and pulp, which are packed with nerves. And we've shown you that you have four types of teeth for a very good reason. Different shaped teeth have different jobs, and only by them working together can you eat safely. Well, Chris, what better way to celebrate our teeth than with a brand new profile picture? What do you think? <laughs>